The next live Patreon event is Monday, April 22nd. Join the Patreon any time before then. Join at any level and you can join us for that live event. And if it is half as chaotic <laughs> as the last one, I mean, you'll get your money's worth just from that live event. Yep. You guys can chat with me. You can ask me anything. And maybe one of your fellow Patreon members will accidentally unmute their screen <laughs> just while they are cursing like a pirate about something. I'd still like to know who that is. Yeah, I, I would definitely be friends with that person. Like, I'll automatically upgrade their Patreon. That was so funny. <laughs> so uh, April 22nd, the link is in the show notes to join. Um, let's talk about trans kids, shall we? Just a nice, light <laughs> subject. Light. I'll just get a bunch of really supportive comments on YouTube. Uh, this will be amazing. But I do, I feel like it's a little bit of an elephant in the room because I talk about modern parenting and the things we struggle with and mainly not having a village and things like that. But I would say one of the the salient parts of um, modern parenting is that it's very common for kids to want to change their gender. So this will be kind of the Gen X <laughs> slash millennial guide to uh, gender and kids and things like that. And I mean, because it's, you know, we thought, I, let me tell you, as Gen X, we were like, no one's ever going to rebel <laughs> more than us. Like, we do drugs, and I know a guy who painted his fe- his his fingernails uh like pink i i know and I, I mean man back in the 90s i was like i do i know like i mean it's just crazy no one's ever going to be crazier than us <laughs> <laughs> and gen z is they're like hold my bong <laughs> like where <laughs> where we're taking it to the next level <laughs> like um Watch this. and so yeah 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 so it's so a lot of us just feel like kind of unprepared uh, but but it's very common. I, I guess for you guys, my, my friends who live in small towns don't hear about this as much. But in the suburbs of any major city, well, certainly in, in the city, but, it, but even in the suburbs, very, very common. Uh, and we live in suburban Texas. So, I, I mean, I would say... I don't know of the of the friends who have been in and out of the house over the years. Our our house is kind of the place where everyone congregates. Half the neighborhood is here at any given time. I mean, I think it's like maybe thirty percent of the kids had changed their name or identify as trans or, or something like that. So we, I mean, this is familiar to us. And and I'm thinking like, man, if this is suburban Texas, I mean, is there anyone who's not trans in like San Francisco? I mean, <laughs> this is, it, it's unusual. So um, I, or it's, I shouldn't say it's, it's like, it's just not what I expected. And it, it's this whole ball of wax and nobody wants to talk about it. And, and, that, well, and some people, frankly, shouldn't talk about it yeah. on both sides of the spectrum. Like it, it's, it's just wild how, I guess before people talk about the trans issue it is customary to take a big full rip off the crack pipe because on both sides of this spectrum people just go into crazy talk as soon as they start talking about it so um this is actually a good time something i've never told you guys but that i did I think it's probably time to reveal about myself is um, I'm actually the only person in the English speaking world who has a reasonable take on the trans <laughs> issue. It's very exciting. This is a, you know, I just, I haven't told you guys that, but now you know. And, uh, and again, lots of people don't want to talk about it for reasons that you can probably glance at my YouTube comments <laughs> and, uh, and figure out why. Um, JF on YouTube.com. But let's go there because it is, it is increasingly something that, uh, man, I'm telling you, unless you live in the town from Footloose, Either your family or a family that you're good friends with will will have a kid who desires to go this direction. And so uh, even if this isn't relevant to your life right now, it will be at some point. Uh, so it, uh, this is also keyed off by, uh, so Ben Affleck and Jennifer Garner used to be married. So breaking news on this podcast, they got <laughs> divorced like seven years ago. <laughs> but this is breaking news to me that they were married. They have, so they had a daughter and... Her name is Serafina Rose. And then just today, there's a picture, uh, JF on YouTube.com. You can see uh, this is episode, what, 202. 202. So you can look this up. Uh, so Serafina Rose is now going by Finn, F-I-N. There's been a name change. Uh, Finn is 15. 
and they're wearing a, a suit traditionally worn by guys like a, it's a it's a sort of a man's suit and uh they you know shave their head and i think they're doing the the they them pronouns and so there's definitely like a buzz cut shave head look and they gave a nice eulogy um at a grandparent's funeral and so this is in the news that uh ben affleck and jennifer garner's daughter is now finn and non-binary or something so people are talking about that so let's talk about how to handle that sort of thing as as sane sane parents let's <laughs> be sane about this issue and and honestly i kind of like this subject um i think it's interesting i think it is i think you know what it is you know what it is all i ask of anyone in the world is intellectual consistency. If if you say that you believe a truth, then follow it through to all of its logical con conclusions. My atheist father very much raised me this way, very much logical thinker, logical thinker, and just be honest about what you really believe and be consistent. So if there is if there is a rule in one area of life that you believe is true, then apply that rule everywhere. Don't selectively apply your rules in your moral code and and nowhere is there more intellectual inconsistency than in these type of topics in modern western culture. So uh, that's why, honestly, I think it's kind of a fun topic. So we will talk about that. We will also talk about j just such a delightful moment with uh, with teens and the eclipse and like how fun it is to have teens kind of balancing out like there are crazy things going on <laughs> with teens that we were not really prepared for. But it's also, it's just so fun. Teens are so fun. And uh, other things like that. It, uh, by the way, I am coming to Lincoln, Nebraska, Austin, Texas. Well, that, that's here. Uh, <laughs> Charlotte, North Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, Birmingham, Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama, Nashville, Tennessee. If you are anywhere near an, any of those cities, you can get your tickets at the link in the show notes or just go directly to jfcomedytour.com. And my comedy special, we will have a special early release in time for Mother's Day. You will be able to get a sneak preview of it yes for mother's day very very exciting uh so welcome to the jen full wider show this is going to be an episode for the ages i just feel it as usual we get to the main topic in the second half of the show i am coming to you from austin texas my name is jen i am a stand-up comic best-selling author and mom of six this is the podcast where you learn the art of the village hustle that's being a hot girl girl boss or hot boy boy boss who knows that love and family and community are the foundation of all true success. Caitlin White is our producer and we publish new episodes every Wednesday morning without fail. I could be in a full body cast with <laughs> Ebola in the hospital and we would not miss a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We did a couple months ago, but it was, I, I had actually a situation worse than that. Um, I had done too much socializing. And for me, honestly, being in a full body cast with Ebola sounds relaxing <laughs> compared to my calendar Spotting. being over. But yeah, you can work with Caitlin at catgstudios.com. That's cat with a K, Cat G Studios. And of course, you get premium content and very chaotic lives where you can ask me anything uh, on Patreon. And I, and I intentionally do it when all the kids are here so so that we have the full chaos. We could do these lives from this studio that I recorded in right now, but where where is the fun in that? We need <laughs> yeah. kids asking us 50 questions and dogs, like we have a dog, Caitlin brings her dog, we have a cat, and then there's kind of a semi-stray cat who is occasionally <laughs> uh, involved, and uh, Caitlin's four kids come over, and our five who are living at home, are, it's, it's incredible, and keep in mind, I have a 1900 square foot house, but it's two stories. So we only have half of that to work with because we, we keep everyone downstairs because the big kids are studying upstairs. Um, so, I mean, it's really, I mean, I if I weren't me, I would join this oh, live yeah. just, <laughs> just to like, I feel, yeah, I'll join the page. I don't, I won't even watch any of the other content. I just wanted, I just want to see these lives. It was 
so chaotic last time. So, uh, and I, I think we'll be recording it so that you can watch it later. But um, I don't really know. Is I can't make any promises <laughs> after the last one. I yeah, and I should say like I, I will try to go live on uh, Monday the twenty second, and I, I haven't posted an official announcement on Patreon uh, yet, but I will. Okay, let us begin. Uh, thank you for your Apple podcast reviews. Love them. Read each one personally. Let us begin. Uh, what's my intro? <laughs> Caitlin, I, 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 I've, I've, got, I've got to get medicated for my ADHD. So guys, I have um, on my phone, I do, I do show notes for each episode. <laughs> so in that there's a section, I have a template that I use. <laughs> there's a section called intro topics and then there's main topic um so for intro topics i have fds 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 <laughs> so forgot to <laughs> film that one okay it's i meant to put eclipse <laughs> there forgot to fill out the template um okay so we were in the line of totality for the eclipse i i just want to say there's another eclipse coming in two years it's worth traveling for we'd mm -hmm. been in 90% totality before, tuh, I spit on 90% totality. It doesn't, like, it's still very bright at, like, 90%. And so, I mean, even even at, like, 95%, it was getting creepy. It was getting, I mean, it, it felt like you were actually speaking of, uh, we, like, it felt like you were in the upside down in Stranger Things. Um, it was creepy. But mm -hmm. it was like, okay, okay. Listen. You listen to me. When that sun hit 100% totality. I I reverted into medieval peasant mode <laughs> immediately. I was like, what have we done to anger God? I have to make some kind of sacrifice to rectify this. There is something very deeply psychological about having it go completely dark in the middle of the day and you look up and where the sun should be, there's just a black hole with flames coming out of it that is a deeply psychologically disturbing <laughs> experience it made me superstitious i was like i need to yeah. i need to get right with god right Sage. now it was yeah yeah like i was that's i'm catholic i'll throw in some hippie practices let's get them all let's do all the religious practices to make sure we have all of our bases covered it it, it was wild and so um some of our kids stayed home from school and then some of the others go to a Catholic school. And my daughter sent me this video. It is one of my personal favorite videos that really ever that our family has captured because it, it just shows how fun teens are. Teens are just, they're fun. They're so much fun. And yes, they have ideas about things that you're like, wait, wait what? You, <laughs> what? You're, wait, what? I, so yeah, I mean, they, they can challenge our assumptions, but... Teens are an endless delight to me. I love having kids. Uh, teen, well, I love having kids generally, but I love having teen kids so much. And and I mean, I just, I just, you know, for fellow moms, for moms who have little ones, if anyone ever says to you, you know, you just wait, you just wait, you wait till they grow up and their teens are not so cute anymore. I really think you should just prayerfully punch them in the face because <laughs> teens are so delightful. They are so wonderful. And if if you just listen more than you talk and let them mm -hmm. tell you about how they see the world and why, and it's good, it's outside of the box and you may agree or you may not, but I, I think sometimes we adults get set in our ways and, and we need a fresh perspective from a 15 year old and usually they won't be like dead on with it but but it's like you know what that is that's actually that brings some fresh air to this subject that was getting a little stagnant for me i i just it's it's an endless delight to have teens i even even the ups and downs i'm not saying we have a perfect family and that everything is always go, gone according to my plan like <laughs> yes every single one of these kids is making all the choices <laughs> that i would have them make i <laughs> i said a couple episodes ago um one of the things with teens is you know you always tell them if you're intoxicated in any way 
you can call me, you know, I can pick you up. And uh, that we that was put to the test <laughs> by one of my <laughs> children. And and sure enough, they did not get in trouble. I said they wouldn't. I Ubered over there and picked them up. And um, that's the nice thing about having so many kids close in age is I can tell these stories and I'm really not <laughs> revealing, you know, I'm, I'm not invading their privacy by saying that. So, um, so yeah, we've, you know, we've had ups and downs. Um but it doesn't matter. It's it's fun. It's just all fun if you let it be fun. I think that's the thing. You, you you have to let it be fun. You have to let go of some control. And you have to switch into more listening mode. I mean, it, it's good to listen to toddlers. Um, my attention span for that does run out pretty, <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, I do have to kind of dissociate and start thinking. About I mean, I love toddlers, but I just, it's a little tough to have long conversations with them. And the, the flow of communication does need to kind of go more one way. Like, don't touch that stove. Don't run in the street. Don't take your diaper <laughs> off and throw it at people. Don't stab mommy's printer with a fork you know I mean it is it needs to be more one-way communication and I think sometimes as parents we what on earth I'm sorry this strange noises in my house maybe it's the eclipse <laughs> maybe I've angered God again He's coming. yeah um so um <laughs> I'm still freaked out by that eclipse by the way I'm, I am I am thinking like a medieval peasant you know I'm like <laughs> need to get on my knees and pray five rosaries um okay so um so with uh I I think that sometimes we get we get stuck in habits as parents so if if you have toddlers especially if you had if you have kids kind of back to back so you really got used to toddler mode you kind of forget to wake up one day and look around and realize, you know, the, these kids aren't toddlers anymore and I might need to change my approach. And I, I have seen parents kind of get stuck in mom of babies and toddlers mode and they're still kind of in that frame of mind when they have a 12-year-old, 14-year-old, 16-year-old. And, you know, you you need to start transitioning into adulthood mode starting around age 10 or so and part of that is just listening and I, I would say especially if your teen kids have ideas that that are crazy or that it just strike you as crazy just listen a, a, a common thing with teens is you know they they very often have crises of faith they're like why are we going to church why is this matter? I saw I saw a youtuber um, you know, named Rathead six five four, who says that God actually doesn't exist and you can't prove it scientifically. And I just, you know, that actually really makes sense to me. It is tempting to. I'm sorry. We need to really figure out what this is. Um, listen, if a poltergeist jumps into this podcast in the middle of this recording. Like, I, I don't know what it's going to take to get you guys to subscribe to my YouTube. If it's not mystery noises and we might be about to have an appearance by a poltergeist and Caitlin is actually crawling under the camera. Look, I don't know what it's going to take to get you guys to subscribe to my YouTube. Okay, where was... Okay, now I'm in the room alone. <laughs> so, um, it is tempting... You could just walk in front of the camera, Caitlin. <laughs> It's tempting to stay in that baby toddler mode with with teens where if they say like, mom, I'm an atheist now, you react like you would a toddler saying, mom, I'm going to touch that stove, that hot, red hot glowing stove. I just I think I'll grab it, just really manhandle it. And so it's tempting to just start talking immediately. No, don't do that. Don't don't be an atheist. Atheism, stupid, you know, whatever. But that's not how it is and 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 I say this as someone who knows literally nothing about parenting like I didn't I'm an only <laughs> child you know I didn't come from big family culture it, you know uh interesting tangent alert hit that sound effect it occurred to me the other day um I never spent more than like five minutes in a room with a pregnant woman until I was like I don't know maybe maybe when I was 27 I went to someone's birthday shower like never none of my friends had little siblings or maybe they had younger siblings but not like babies um I mean I just I didn't 
I think maybe one time my mom took me to a baby shower for a woman I didn't even know, but I was in the room with a pregnant woman for like two hours for that baby shower. Literally the longest time I was ever in the room with a pregnant woman. So I, I know I just, my, <laughs> I know nothing about, you know, family life and raising kids, but I will say that my kids are great. We're having a lot of fun as a family. So, um, so this is my anecdotal experience based on my family alone. But so, you know, if, if your kids espouse a viewpoint that you don't think is the right one, and, and you might even think this is damaging to them, maybe related to the main topic that we'll get into, just get this in your head now. Moms of little kids, just get this in your head now. R like really make it a mantra. <laughs> when my teens say something that strikes me as crazy, when they espouse a viewpoint that I strongly disagree with, my first reaction will be to ask questions. And my second reaction will be to listen. And I will not interrupt. And yes, of course, there is a place for you sharing your viewpoint too. But your viewpoint is much more likely to be heard if this person is first allowed to talk at length about what is on their mind. And and by the way, I mean, I, I've had conversations sometimes with my kids, frankly, sometimes with their friends, where it, it takes them like fully an hour to just think through everything that's on their mind. I mean, a full 60 minutes. And of it's really just them talking and me just saying, I'm listening, I'm listening, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then maybe maybe like 90 minutes in, they've, you know, they've kind of exercised everything they want to say on this issue. And, and then, you know, I'll say, well, can I share my perspective on that? And these conversations go so much better when you have set aside that time for listening. And, and because we love our kids, especially if they are saying something that we, we're concerned about, if they're like, mom, listen, you know what is for me is being a circus carny. Um, it, that's the path that I'm definitely going to do. And I'm going to be a carny. And I'm going to travel with the circus. And that's and I'm going to drop out of high school to do this. Now, see, that's really hard to be in listening mode. It's really hard um, not to start screaming like, you know, but <laughs> hey, let's, you know, uh, we how about college? How about not doing that? You know, I always hoped you'd be an accountant. So this is a little bit of a different path. It's very hard to shut your mouth and keep it shut and just nod. But let me tell you, the communication and the conversations and the information flow that you will get is 10x, 10x just flow of love and communication when you spend as much time as it takes for this child to finish telling you about their viewpoint and how they came to this conclusion. So uh, now back to the eclipse, teens in the eclipse, <laughs> teens are so much fun. Okay, so this is a daughter, this is a daughter, this is a video that my daughter <laughs> took. She goes to a Catholic school. It is of the eclipse. And it, it's just so cool that, that to see the kids reaction to it. And um, what I love too, is there are nuns in the video. We have the Dominican sisters of Mary, mother of the Eucharist. They're good friends of mine. I, I adore them so much. Uh, billionaire listeners, even if you're not Catholic, could you just go give them a few million dollars? I, I'm telling you, when the Comedy Millions come in, that's going to be the most well-funded organization. I'm just going to write the Dominican sisters like massive checks all the time. I'm going to be their daddy warbucks. Okay, so uh, okay, so play this video. Um, this is yeah. So this is this is the eclipse at my kids' Catholic school. By the way, JF on YouTube.com. That's where you can see this. But the audio is great too. It's like, okay, on the video, think of it as like twice as dark as it actually is. Like, it's like the color gray outside right now. Like, yeah, this iPhone video makes it look way lighter than it was. L listen to the kids screaming as it goes into totality. <laughs> that's sick. <laughs> Dude, that's so cool. 
All right, that's oh, good. You can't see- um, it's it's so cute to hear the kids mm-hmm. just screaming and getting so excited, and you know, and that's what you know Galileo said when he saw his first eclipse. He said, "Dude, that's sick." <laughs> that is, yeah, historical uh, fun fact there. <laughs> so, um, Caitlin, could you text someone to turn the AC down mm-hmm. in here? There's a lot going on behind the scenes. <laughs> this is a this is a uh, <laughs> this is a chaotic podcast. So, um, so yeah, I just I just really I'm so delighted by that video that I I just wanted to share it. And it was, it's again, it's one of my favorite videos that our family has ever captured because it just shows, it just shows the fun of being around teens. And and again, I love it that you can see nuns in the video as well. Not those of you who don't subscribe to my YouTube channel. You're not, you're, this is theater of the mind. We're just describing it for you. But um, you can see nuns in the video, which one, adds an apocalyptic air to, you know, the sun disappeared and here's a nun. That's a little, that's a little scary. Um, But just to, I don't know, it made me wish I'd gone out to their school. If I had known how cool that would be, I would have gone out to their school and watched it there because that it's just so neat to see the teens getting so excited and yelling like, dude, that's sick. It's (laughs) it's so cute. So um, do not be afraid of having teens. It's, it is, they're just the most delightful human beings. They're, they're so wonderful. And I love, oh, I just love being around teens. Um, okay. Uh, final thing. Let's see. What, how are we on time? Okay. Uh, I'm going to, l- l- let me make a couple of comments before we get into the main somewhat controversial topic. I am, this, this is a, an absolute aside. This is just a little, a small question. Um, what do husbands do with their phones after they get off the phone with their wives. Because every time I call my husband right back after we got off the phone, like, oh, I thought of something. I need to call him right back. It goes to voicemail. And I'm like, but but see, I know for a fact that two seconds ago, you had your phone in your hand. <laughs> and I'm genuinely curious. I'm not mad. I'm just curious. And you know, that's the truth. When a wife says that, I'm not mad. I'm just curious. Is it like, there's sort of a tradition of like, does he block me immediately <laughs> after we talk? Like, I've heard enough from this woman today. I, I, yeah. I am, I've got my quota of wife talk today, block. <laughs> or maybe he goes into the Stranger Things vortex. Maybe that is where he actually lives during the day. And then he comes out of the vortex to call me. And then he goes back into the vortex. <laughs> does he, is there a ritual where he puts his phone into a a sealed lockbox with a timer on it as soon as we get off the phone. I do, I do, I am curious to know. Maybe maybe it's elves. Maybe elves spirit away his phone. <laughs> well, not I mean or gnomes. It could be it could be a lot of different things, but maybe that's where the phone goes. Cuz I, I I just I am curious. How, it's like I it was in your hand 2 seconds ago. So, I'm just <laughs> I'm just curious where it went. I'm just curious. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> See, curiosity, guys. It's an important value. Okay, they, here's just another snippet. To be honest, I'm sort of dragging my feet on getting to the main topic, but this is good. Because see, even here's the thing with this podcast. Even when I drag my feet, it is like more hot fire mm-hmm. content that like actually adds value to your life than any other podcast you're going to listen to. So um, you know what I realized with okay that was a new strange noise that was different than the last strange noise i hope the mics are picking this up so you can hear what we're dealing with um so uh so i i'm I'm back on this weight thing and i i openly admit guys weight just it goes up and down you know it's as you guys know i infamously i I lost the 40 pounds back in 2017 i lost 40 pounds and 30 of it have just forever stayed off like i just those 30 pounds are i have not gained that back i haven't been back in that tory territory since 2017 um but i um but i have i there is a 10 that i kind of it comes and goes there's a 10 pound range that i fluctuate in between and I've been working on some diet stuff. This is really a teaser for a future episode, but I've been working on some diet stuff. And you know what I realized is it's very important to know your core values before you commit to any diet plan. So a core value is just one um, some aspect of the way you see the world that is more important to you than other 
aspects. And everyone probably has, I don't know, a handful that they could identify. So let me let me give you a practical example. I have realized in working on my diet stuff that one of my core values is being a bon vivant, is, uh, you know, enjoying life. Uh, just, you know, if other people are mixing it up, I'm going to mix it up too. <laughs> or, or like if, if my neighbor comes over and says, oh, I just tried this incredible new pie recipe and I j- it's knocked it out of the park. I want you guys to try it. I'm just, I'm going to try that pie. Now, obviously, if you have health condition food allergies, that's different. But just, I'm just not going to be like, I'm, on, I'm doing a whole 30. I mean, to me, I don't fully understand the point of being alive if you're if you're going to be that way, I mean, yeah, it's like, oh, I, I mean, so he, so this is core value, but this is what I'm saying. This is kind of how you know if this is a core value for you. For you, it might not be. Like my my trainer, um, she is such a naturally healthy, physically active woman. I mean, she's she is just about health and physical activity, and that's really one of her core values: is nutrition first, keeping it locked down peak physical performance. And and for her, because that is a core value, when she imagines, like, let's say how I was living during December, where mm-hmm. it was just, I mean, it was like, you know, the sugar in that Pims and Lemonade that I just had is not enough. Why don't we also make a hot chocolate, add marshmallows to it, have a chocolate cake, and now that dinner is over, what should I have for dessert? Because uh, that was my dinner. So, you know, maybe a little ice cream for dessert. I mean... Nobody would think that's a great idea, but I think to my personal trainer, she would have one of those like, why be alive moments like that. That sounds so gross and terrible to her. Whereas to me, that sounds like a Tuesday, (laughs) you know, that (laughs) sounds kind of, I mean, it sounds like pros and cons. I mean, I shouldn't live that way forever, but, um, also sounds kind of fun. But to her, I mean, I, I, I'm not even kidding. Like, I think Dana would physically feel ill thinking about living that kind of life where it's about um you know just being super indulgent eating sugary food sitting on your couch watching shows we all agree that that's not the perfect way to live every day but if your reaction is like seriously it gives me the heebie-jeebies that sounds so gross i i would feel disgusted if i lived one day like that then you have a core value of fitness and peak health and optimum health. And so for Dana, if she had a neighbor that came over and said, hey, I just made this incredible new pie recipe, wanted to see if you could try it. I mean, uh, Dana would probably have a slice of the pie maybe, but it like if she had committed to a Whole30, she wouldn't have a problem being like, you know what? I'm on a Whole30. I'm really big on this commitment right now, but why don't I walk with you to the other neighbor's house? And I bet we can find a lot of people in this neighborhood who want to try this pie. So she'd be super fun and cool about it, but because she has a core value of peak health and fitness and all that, it would not stress her out at all to stick to her Whole30. Whereas for me, to get me to bail on a whole 30 or any kind of diet commitment, uh, it can be like you are a goldfish cracker on the ground. And I'm like, well, if you want me to eat you, I, okay, okay, twist my arm. Like it takes nothing for me to bail on a diet. And, and I realize because of core values, because my core value, one of my core values is being a bon vivant. And so, yes, I'm going to try the pie Yes, you know, I, I'm I'm just I'm going to go to the neighbor's barbecue and eat the barbecue. And it's just a core value of mine. So then the question is, how do you find a plan that keeps you at a weight where you're not spilling over your skinny jeans as I actually am right now? Um, you know, how do you find a way to live that core value, but be at a weight that you like? And I don't know the answer to that question yet, but that's <laughs> but that's what I'm working on. And I think I think that's when when you're reading books or, or thinking of diet, weight loss, whatever plans. That's one thing that no one else will tell you to think about. How is this podcast for you, Caitlin? <laughs> no one else will tell you to think about this. That there are a million different diet plans out there. There's intermittent fasting. There's Whole Thirty. There's more exercise based plans where it's real. It's like P ninety X or something, that sort of thing. Um, they can all work mostly, but 
you have to find one that fits with your core values. So first figure out what what are your what are your core values when it comes to how you want to engage with your body and fitness in the world and food and life and then find a plan that works with that. And that's what I'm working on right now. Um I have some spaghetti ready for after the podcast. So Caitlin <laughs> will get to see me um, eat like I am in training for a sumo wrestling competition <laughs> and be like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intermittent fast tomorrow. Oh, oh, oh. Um, it'll be great. I, I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> Just fine. And then we're going to have the most hot fire podcast episode of all time where I tell you all the secrets. All right. Okay. Let's. Okay. Before we get to the main topic, uh, episode 35 of the Village Hustle Patreon is out. Um, I give you my secrets for making public speaking so easy. I mean, you just, it's like, you'll just be an incredible public speaker. Uh, and then th this is of the Village Hustle Patreon, that second level. And, um, but here's the main thing. I tried a hair volume hack. Oh, wait, actually, let's let's pull it up. Caitlin, if I airdrop this to you, can we get it up pretty mm -hmm. quickly? Yeah. Play it without sound because there it's two different videos of me, so it will sound super weird. Um, but yeah, play this without sound. I cannot believe how well this hair volume hack worked. That's what we do on the Village Hustle Patreon is I give you tips, but sometimes, not always, but sometimes I do kind of a get ready with me video with makeup, wardrobe, hair, whatever. And so I, I had seen this um, hack to make your hair look thicker and just more rich and, and more volume. And Caitlin is about to pull up JF on YouTube.com um, the before and after. And for those of you who are on audio, I, I'll just describe it. It's actually pretty easy to describe. Um, imagine me having totally flat hair and then imagine me just having j just everything you would expect from a Texas woman look at this look at this on the youtube look that's a good i mean oh, caitlin come on that's amazing i need that <laughs> right right so i showed you how to do that on on the village hustle patreon that is i mean that is some serious volume that is a compelling before and after and that is what you get in addition to very chaotic lives <laughs> <laughs> when you join my patreon the link is in the show notes patreon.com slash this is jen trans kids let's do it um <laughs> all right so ben affleck and jennifer garner's daughter is uh is in the news and okay so first of all let, all right <laughs> we have to lay some groundwork here if you um let me say this if you trust me to be a person of goodwill and do not follow me primarily because you are waiting for me to make a misstep that shows that I am a hater, either like I'm too Catholic or I'm not Catholic enough or something like that. Um, and if you're like, I'm just tracking with whatever Jen says and I'm going to keep an open mind, then you can skip the next five minutes because it's going to take me a minute to prove that I am a person of goodwill. But I do have to establish <laughs> my bona fides here and also my... Um, I, I just need to make a few things clear about my worldview and my experience so that people know who they are hearing from on this issue. Wouldn't it be funny if I were like, I'm trans? <laughs> that, that'd be amazing. That'd be so fun. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> you said something earlier that I thought you were going to make a joke and then you and here we are. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, this whole podcast is a joke. I mean, it's like one long joke okay so first of all uh i'm catholic i agree with everything the catholic church says um i listen i've got you know how there's the amex black card have you heard of this mm -hmm. it's you know i've got the catholic ghetto black card okay <laughs> um I came so close to dying in my sixth pregnancy that nobody could figure out how I was alive because I have a disorder that is exacerbated by pregnancy. It makes it very dangerous for me. Um, and and by the way, that kid with that pregnancy, that kid turned 11 on the day of the full eclipse. Let me uh. just say, the healing that that brought me cannot be overstated. Okay, so, and uh, because I'm Catholic, and I'm 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 really into what the church says. Um, I so I had to stop having kids, and that was 11 years ago. Because like I could I mean what happened was my lungs filled with blood clots, which is normally fatal. But what's crazy is I was on blood thinners, 
and they were like, there is literally nothing we can do to stop you from dying because the blood thinners have stopped working. So if you get pregnant again, very unlikely that you'll very unlikely that you'll make it through because all we can do is give you blood thinners and they're not working for you during pregnancy. So um, I still didn't use contraception and we didn't do sterilization because I think the church is right about it. I was raised lifelong atheist, lifelong atheist. And my husband and I both converted to Catholicism because we were like, this is an internally consistent worldview that makes sense. They've got the owner's manual to the human soul and... It's just, I just think it's right. So that so we never did no sterilization, no contraception, even though my life was at risk with pregnancy. So that and that was eleven years ago. So uh, and then um, so Pope Benedict has his his final book. So he passed away a while back, but uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict, um, he his final collection of writings was published obviously after his death and it just came out guess whose name is on the back cover as an endorser yes that would be my name oh. um so that is how legit am i in the catholic ghetto my catholic ghetto street cred is at like level ten thousand right now <laughs> because only four people's names are on the back cover of pope benedict's final work this is his and, and he published a gazillion things his final body of work was released i am on the back as an endorser that is how catholic i am i i am the all high supreme i almost said grand wizard <laughs> no not that i am the Close. i have the catholic the, the you know i've got the the platinum card um so uh so i'm 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 guys no one's deeper in the catholic ghetto than i am so then meanwhile I have a lot of friends in the comedy industry who have different perspectives. They are not Orthodox Catholics. They are <laughs> not, you know, sold out on everything that the church <laughs> teaches. And in fact, the other day I was hanging out with, with a group of Austin comics and like many of them are trans, gay, whatever. All of them are, you know, hookup culture, that whole thing. Um, and I am great friends with them and I love them. I think that they're wonderful. And and people say, and I think by people, I mean the Catholic ghetto, mm -hmm. and they say, and I, I think this is a fair question, they say, but what about like if you think that someone is um, part of a worldview that is not good for people? Like if I have a friend who's just hooking up with everyone, just new guy every night, you know, and t talking about it openly and all the stuff that comes with that. I mean, like, <laughs> Yeah, actually, I won't go into detail on that. But suffice it to say, some of them, you know, they put post their clips on Instagram of like, oh, I did this last night. And it's like, oh, girl, <laughs> don't tell the Pope. Oh, oh my. Um, and and, and I, I love these people. Um, and so they say, but this is you think that this worldview is harmful. So why would you be friends with someone Um you know, who, who is part of a harmful worldview. And I, I do something kind of interesting. It's a philosophy called having a life <laughs> and not ghettoizing yourself. I, I, I don't understand and I will never understand a ghettoized mentality because I was subjected to that as an atheist child. People knew that my family didn't go to church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in the 80s. That was unheard of i mean we might as well have had like demonic imagery <laughs> on our house the way we were ostracized and so there were quite a few christian families who were these holy rolling baptist people who would not let me go over to their house because we were not church going people we were pretty openly atheist and doesn't that make sense you know don't don't let that kid over here whose family has a different worldview she might like encounter jesus no. i mean she might she might like see a bible in our house because there's not one in her house and we would not ever want her to be in a space where she might like accidentally pick up a bible or you know see a picture of jesus or you know some religious imagery and be like hey tell me what that's about we, we would not want that to happen <laughs> so as someone who grew up on the outside of the christian ghetto of people and by the way when i say ghetto i'm using the term in the in the most literal definition of a ghetto a ghetto is you know it's been often it's used in like hip-hop culture people talking about i'm from compton i'm from the ghetto but the classic definition is a ghettoized community is people who wall themselves off 
from the outside world and they are purists and and there are often litmus tests of are you are you a purist are you really part of our ghetto and we see this uh, both in the catholic world and in hip hop music that there are often you hear in rap songs like litmus tests of you know th- this guy ended up making a lot of money and he you know, got like he got out of the ghetto. And so he's not really one of us anymore. He lives in a nice neighborhood with a white picket fence and a nice yard. And now he's not he's not one of us. He's not really like from the streets of Compton or whatever. Rappers have been talking about this for 30 years about how um, it drives them crazy that the ghettoized community they come from also has purity tests. And if you're not involved in this or in that, or at least you're not publicly showing that you're involved in certain activities, then it's like, oh, you're not, you're not part of our gang anymore. You're not, you're not a real one. And the Catholic ghetto works the exact same way. And, and frankly, so does the Protestant ghetto. So, do, so does any kind of ghettoized community. I'm sure the Wiccan ghetto is the same way. I've, I know some crystal hippies that are like that, that are like, you know, she, um, I didn't see her with her amethyst out at the eclipse. <laughs> So some, you know, some people say they're Wiccans <laughs> and other people actually live it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying uh, some of us care about having amethyst, you know, during the eclipse. It's in every ghettoized community does the same thing. And so I don't believe in putting up walls like that. And um, th- there's a, a type of I'm using my own faith as an example, but this can be true of any people of any faith or any identifiable community, whether it's the hip hop community, an urban underprivileged community, Catholic community, Protestant community. Um, uh, it's, it, it can be tempting to put up those walls to, you know, keep the outsiders out. But every, every religion, every group of people has kind of the, I think of it as almost like the, the urban Catholics, like the people who, if you've ever met Catholic ghetto people who are like, you know, they're deep in the faith. They're, they're in it. I mean, they believe like me, you know, don't use contraception. Like they're, they're in all this stuff, friends with a ton of priests. Like if you pull up father FR in my phone, it fills the whole screen of all (laughs) the phone numbers that I have in there and brother BR sister. Yeah. It's, um, people like that, but they live in San Francisco or they live in LA or they live in New York. It's like, they're very serious about the faith, but when you live in that urban big city environment, you just, encounter a lot of people and it's just part of it and actually again i'm not just talking to the catholics here but um a lot of the early dominicans uh dominican is a catholic religious order they had interesting things to say about it because unlike some monks and religious orders they were not cloistered sitting up on a hill A, a lot of religious orders have the vision of um we are withdrawing from society to pray for society and so that's that's their thing and and that that's valid. That's great. But then the Dominicans said, "We're we're going into the cities. We're going into the streets. We are encountering real people." And there's some interesting writing from the early Dominicans, like, "Yeah, yeah, our brothers are exposed to some crazy stuff that the Carthusians aren't, you know, exposed to, because um, they're up on a hill fasting." And yeah, it's like they they know different people. They hear crazy things because their particular calling is to be out in the mix among different people. And and, and I, I actually think there's not one right or wrong way to do things. I know people who live in small towns where it's very homogeneous. It's very, everyone is kind of the the same. They all kind of have the same religion. You never encounter different points of view. And if that's your thing, if that's what makes you feel comfortable, then great, do it. I mean, that's, that is a valid way to live. But I'm, I am the type of person, I am definitely in that more, urban mindset, meaning I'm not happy unless I have one next door neighbor who is a Muslim imam, and then another next door neighbor who is like, you know, a a drag queen dancer, (laughs) and then another one who's like Catholic like me, and then another one who is, I don't know, like a straight Baptist, you know, is in the mix. I mean, I... it, It For me, it is speaking of core values. One of my core values for me Uh, This doesn't have to be everyone's core value, but is um, worldview diversity. I just came up with that term. (laughs) Worldview diversity. That is one of my core values. I, I would lose 
my mind, if I lived in some small town where everyone agreed with me, I'd the 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 level of Adderall that I would have to be on, I'd have to get like elephant Adderall. Whatever they give to elephants, that's what I'd have to take <laughs> to live in a town where everyone saw the world my way and agreed with me. So is it, that was not a knock on the door. Surely no. not. Okay. Um, not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I don't know what is going on outside this door. Maybe it is. Maybe it's a poltergeist. I mean, I, yeah. I actually, this might be like in the movie Poltergeist. If I just get sucked into a, a glowing light the that is behind this door, like the little girl in Poltergeist, just don't be shocked because that's how this day is going over here. So, okay. So uh, worldview diversity is a core value of mine. For, maybe your core value is lack of worldview diversity i the, you might be saying like my core value is being in a ghetto jen because other people get on my last nerve i hate their bad opinions and yes i want to live in a town with five thousand people who all think the exact same way i do i actually think that's totally fine you just need to know that about yourself okay trans kids i have not forgotten where we're going with this <laughs> um so that is what like if you see me on social media and I'm hanging out with people and you look up their Instagram, you might be like, oh, that mm, OK. <laughs> but I, just because I hang out with someone does not mean that I am just 100 percent on board with everything, w with all of their viewpoints. And the other thing is, uh, do I want to see change in the world where everyone stops being wrong and thinks exactly like I do? Actually, yes, yes, I do. I think that everyone should agree with me on literally everything, <laughs> but probably not going to happen. And listen, if I'm going to be an evangelist for Orthodox Catholicism, for my alternative lifestyle worldview, I, I mean, I, I can't. There's not enough time in the day because first of all, I'd have to start with the Catholics. One of the reasons that my conscience is as clear as it could be with some of the wild people that I hang out with, I mean, truly wild, um, is I'm I'm quite scarred from some of the things that I encountered in the Catholic world. Um, and I will say not clergy. I, I've had uniformly just wonderful experiences with Catholic priests. I love them so much. So I'm, I'm talking about the lay people who are in quote unquote ministry. Um, I will not go into great detail because I don't want to discourage anyone. And I think that all of the Catholics listening would feel obliged to become atheists if they heard <laughs> all of the guys, some of these people, they're such frauds. It would honestly take your breath away. Some of these people, they have true full-fledged narcissistic personality disorder. So like, listen, if I am going to go evangelize for the faith and make sure everyone's like living, living the true Christian way, it would take me a thousand years of work just to deal with the people in Catholic ghetto media. I'm not even talking about the general Catholic ghetto. I'm just talking about media. Some of these people, like being abusive to their wives and family, saying truly psychotic things to women they don't even know behind closed doors, be like having a level of megalomaniacal narcissism that is like, there have been dictators in history who would be like, that guy's really full of himself. Like this guy needs to relax. Like he needs to take a break. So um, that is what, like, I, I just had to let it all go. I'm nobody's babysitter. Um, people can do what they want with their lives. And um, I, I just, I don't care. Uh, I happen to think that my worldview is completely right. And I try to witness for that by the way I live. It's, it's actually, seriously, it's one of the reasons I'm on stories all the time. And I have a lot of people actually telling me um, it's wild that God will work through some dumb thing I said on stories and someone will message me, someone I know to be very much atheist, very much not walking with the Lord, like in any way. Um, and, and they'll message me like, man, that looks like, you know, I just saw your story about like going to mass and I know you were making a joke about how everything fell apart, but like, ah, oh, that made me miss church. Like, is, do you know of a church, you know, that I could go to? That happens a surprising amount. And I think for me, when I stop controlling people and telling them how to live and I just live my best life, but in a public way, that seems to be what, how God wants to like work through me. So you will say, I mean, probably even more and more, you'll probably see me associating with a lot of people who don't share my worldview. And I love them genuinely. Um, okay. 
I was going to go on a tangent about that, but I won't hit, <laughs> hit the, I just saved us a 10 minute tangent. I'm, let me, let me get to the subject. <laughs> trans kids, trans kids is what we're trying to talk about here. Okay. So, um, when, when you encounter a kid, your kid, your kid's friends, whatever, who um, has decided that they would like to be a different gender, I think my first advice would be to relax. Uh, everyone gets um, very upset about this. And I understand being upset with institutions, especially government institutions that would do irreversible surgeries and harm to minors. I mean, we'll get to that in a minute. That's crazy. So I, I understand getting upset about that sort of thing. But if a kid just comes over, it's one of your kid's friends or something, and they're, you know, they have a new name. That's the other thing is, is choosing new names is a really big thing. And uh, very, very, very common in, um, in the school system, at least where I live in suburban Texas. Don't, that's not something to get wound up about. Now, if they're like, hey, for my 10th birthday, the Mayo Clinic offered to reverse my entire gender for free. Okay, okay get upset about that and put a stop to that. But if, if they're just talking about exploring this, um, then again, what, what do we do when, when teens and young people start saying things that are surprising to us and that we might think a different direction would be ideal? Uh, we listen, we listen, start by listening. Um, but, but I really think that this, in general, as a societal conversation, this doesn't have to be the hot button issue that it is because, and this is the salient thing that no one else is saying. So th this is really the crux of my point on just the, the trans issue generally. Um, the idea of identity changes is not new and all of civilization has very, very similar processes and steps that people go through to change their identity. And I, I think that with the trans debate, if we would simply adopt these age old principles of what you do before you change your gender, then we can take a lot of the heat out of this discussion. So here's what I mean. Okay, so identity changes. What's an identity change? Uh, so it, in, let's take Western civilization. So in, uh, so in the West, uh, so from time immemorial, like going way back, one big identity change is people would become a monk or a nun or a priest. And, and that is a full on identity change. You get a new name in, in some cases, depending on the order that you join, um, like the one of the Dominican sisters I know, Sister Elizabeth Ann. I actually don't know her birth name. I have no idea what her birth name is. Uh, my uh, cousin, who is an iconographer monk at Mount Angel Abbey, his name is Brother Claude Lane. Claude is not his birth name. That That is his name that he took when he entered the monastery. And by the way, um, the original gender benders, uh, it, is, it is fairly common in Catholicism for monks and nuns to take names of the opposite gender. So uh, Sister Joseph Andrew is another one of the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. Um, Sister Thomas Aquinas is a, another amazing woman. And, um, and then what one of my one of my good buddies, uh, Father John Maria Devaney. So I think I think John was actually his given name because he's part of a different uh, order. But Oh, no, no, it's not actually, I guess he must. Have, well, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> whatever. But his middle name is Maria, and I also know I know a father Joseph Mary, who's part of an order. He took the name Mary as uh, as part of his name. So it's kind of interesting that there's even a you know sort of playing with gender sort of tone even in these classic identity changes. Another identity change is uh, getting married. I mean, in that case, the woman traditionally changes her name, so there is a name change involved, and and mainly a a social identity change. I mean, we wear rings to indicate that a social identity has been taken on. Um, and obviously in the case of priests and monks and nuns, 
they wear something different every day. They dress differently to show that an identity change has taken place. And then also, I mean, someone becoming a king or a queen, it was traditional that they would take a, a king name or a queen name. You know, Elizabeth didn't, but others um, others have. They have chosen to do, you know, they might become George, the whatever, and that wasn't necessarily their birth name. So, so this is identity changes are not new. I know with the the trans thing, it can feel like this is brand new. I mean, nobody did this back in the day, but it's kind of not new because identity changes are not new. And so let's look at the the history of identity. Let, let let's take the trans off the table for a second and let's talk about how these rules of identity change came into place because back in the day, let's say it was like A 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, it was common for kids to want to run off to the monastery to become a monk or a nun or to get married young. This is age old, you know, your 14-year-old, I'm in love, we want to get married. And so certain structures got put in place. And back, if we're talking, you know, way back, like 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, uh, the eight, all of the ages were shifted younger because everyone was like their teeth were falling out and they were elderly <laughs> and dying by the time they were 32. It was like, I'm ancient. I'm going to die now. So everything was shifted a little younger. But one thing that is universal was the idea that in order to make a social identity change, you have to be a full adult. And so Again, if, if you're talking 800 AD, you might be considered a full adult at 14, 15, and now it would be a different age. But uh, you have to be considered a full adult, whatever that number is for your culture, and you have to take time, the best practice anyway, is that you take time to prepare for this, to discern this, to just figure out if, if this is definitely something that you want to do. And that, that's how you can tell that a lot of these activists with the the trans debate are unserious people because they don't suggest any formalized social structures for discernment for like, hey, let's take a breath and just follow a process like let's let's look at the monastery process. Let's look at the process of becoming a monk or a nun and maybe model our process after that. Like and frankly, I would still disagree. I mean, I'm this is coming from my science side, not my catholic side. I don't, I don't think surgery and drugs change gender, but look, adults can do what they want to do. I was hanging out with trans people the other day. Couldn't care less. Live your life. But as an adult, like let me, this example will make it clear. If you, so people get freaked out. If, if their 14 year old comes to them and says, I want to change my gender, like we talked about uh, Jennifer Garner and Ben Affleck. So their kid said, My name is now Finn and I'm, I want to do this gender thing or whatever. Um, I think the right response is to take the debate of, is it even possible scientifically? Is it even possible to change your gender? I would say table that for a second, like just just take that off the table for a second and say, look, it actually doesn't matter whether I agree or disagree with you on this subject, because for any social identity change, there should be a process. And it's not something that you do when you're a minor. And it, and a, a point that you could make there, and this is the analogy I was getting to, that if even today, if a 14 year old comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to become a nun. Like I'm going to make final vows. I'm leaving this house. I'm moving in with the nuns and that's what I'm about and that's what I'm going to do. I mean, you'd be like, hey, take a breath. Like, <laughs> No, like, or if they say, I'm going to get a face tattoo or if they say, I'm going to get married. Like what culture has always understood that people who are not yet adults should not undertake social identity changes because they are difficult to reverse. Even if nothing physical permanent has been done, It is difficult to reverse. Anyone who has been through a divorce knows that. You went through a social identity change when you got married and even take everything else out of the equation. It was difficult to just reverse the social people seeing you as a married person and now they need to see you as a single person. I mean, every one of my divorced friends has said people would, they think they're still married and they have to, then people are nosy about it. Society has always understood that you you don't 
want to be too light about social identity changes because they're difficult to undo and life happens even with even with being a nun being a monk things that are supposed to be super super deep and sacred look stuff happens monasteries are prepared for this convents are prepared for this yes you make final vows before god and it's the whole thing but you know what life is crazy things happen and there should always be a path out and that's yet another thing that with the activists, I'm not talking about the average person who identifies that way, but with the activists, it's like they act like no one ever changes their mind about it. The, and, and with life in anything, people always change their mind about everything. People change their minds about being married. They change their minds about being nuns. I mean, that's just life. And that's why like as a, as a monk or a nun, you don't get like a tattoo across your face that says like, you know, Dominican sister. Cause you know what, even though you made vows and, and you were really serious about this when you joined, life can sometimes go sideways, things can happen. And that's why like you, you there's nothing permanent that's irreversible that happens in those situations because just, you know, human history, like we just know that nothing, nothing is perfect. And there's no group of people that 100% of them are going to make a final decision that is never reversed. And so you have to plan for that. Okay. But here's, here's the main thing that I wanted to point out. So with all of these things, getting married, becoming a monk, becoming a queen or a king or pope or whatever, there's always a uh, pope is a little different because that's voted on, but okay, <laughs> hang on. Um, there's always a period of discernment followed by a public ceremony to cement the change that happens when you are an adult. We would all agree, no matter what your faith is or whatever, so for getting married, best practices are if your 14-year-old is determined to get married and they're like, no, mom, it's gonna make me really depressed if I can't, I have to get married and I have to have kids even. Like we need to do permanent things starting right now. Uh, I mean, you would say, look, I, I might even believe you. Maybe, I think that maybe you will be with this person for life. But, but you have to wait until you're an adult to make this change because it's, it's a social identity change. And then if you have kids, that is a very physical, permanent, that's truly irreversible, like change. And so you can't do that until you're an adult. And same thing if your kid comes and says, I, I just, oh, I'll be so depressed if I can't be a nun right now. Like, well, I'm sorry. Well, let's work through that. That's, that sounds like a legit problem. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that that's causing you depression. That's a valid problem. I hear what you're saying. Um, so let's, let's work through that and let you find peace with being a kid who can't yet make permanent, semi-permanent, whatever, social identity changes. Um, but the answer is not to be like, well, go join the monastery then at age 14. Mm -hmm. No, it's like just what what you're feeling, you may end up doing that for the rest of your life, but I can't support that decision until you are at the age that our society considers an adult, which is 18, 21, you know, that kind of range. I, I would say if you're not old enough to buy alcohol, you, you need to you need to hit the brakes on other, you know, permanent <laughs> uh, changes. So I actually looked up what like what the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, their process. So you start in postulancy and that, that's what you're hanging out. You're just checking it out. You're just seeing if you like the vibe. That's you know, you're, you're just you're just checking out the lifestyle. And I, I don't I don't think you wear a habit. Maybe you dress kind of more conservatively. You know, you don't have the thong hanging out. <laughs> of your skinny jeans with your tube top anymore. It's like you dress, you know, kind of like the sisters. To be honest, I didn't read that part, but <laughs> it is called <laughs> postulancy. And then the novitiate, this lasts for multiple years. Multiple years. You are living that kind of way, but you're not, you have not taken final vows and you can still leave anytime. And so this is a, between postulancy and novitiate, this is a multi-year process. You're just kind of figuring it out. And again, you can al analogize this to being engaged that that's we all have an idea that the best practice is you date for a while casually then you get more serious then you get engaged you have a period of engagement and then you get married no one is like oh you met this person you should get married the next day i know it happens but we we wouldn't say like that's the best practice everyone should do that so then after the novitiate there's the scholasticate 
and and you make final vows and that is a it is done in community because also think about this that um if you are going to make a social identity change your community kind of needs to know about it you you can't just show up one day and you know you're like okay like if caitlin walks into the podcast studio for episode 203 and she's wearing a Benedictine nun's habit. And she's like, I'm Sister Mary Eucharista of the Cross now. That would cause me a lot of stress. <laughs> I'd be like, what? Well, because Caitlin's not even Catholic. So I'd be like, what? Because uh, uh, what? <laughs> uh. think about this. When you make a social identity change, your community needs space to journey with you on that and they need a place to gather in community and mourn the person you used to be we have talked about how trauma is best worked out in a village and there is a minor trauma even if it is a good and beautiful thing when someone becomes a nun or gets married, or becomes a monk, or becomes a priest, or even like when I watched one episode of The Crown, <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and I mean the moment when Elizabeth became queen was like there was almost this sense of mourning for her, like she doesn't get to be a regular chick anymore. Like her life of just you know being a girl, a rich girl, but you know, <laughs> I mean her, it's she's losing something because there are obligations with her new status in life and so and there's a public ceremony where people who knew her as just the daughter of the king can now get used to that so like i'm kind of kidding but it is really imagine i'm good friends with caitlin and if caitlin she decides to convert to catholicism she is sister mary eucharista of the cross <laughs> i would have to mourn the fact that she's not Caitlin anymore like I would need to journey through that because I would be losing something even though I would be gaining something which is the awesome Catholic ghetto street cred of like well my friend's a nun so I think it's pretty happening? clear whose side God is on like oh I just drop that all the time uh, and then we'd have to talk to your mother superior like she can still do the podcast right um, but, but really think about that if think of who is your good friend okay think of that person Imagine if they told you tomorrow that they are becoming a monk or a nun. They will be, you know, wearing the full habit. They will be changing their name, leaving you in this community and living in an order. You would, well, depending on if you're Catholic or not, you might be excited. You might be like, wow, that's, that's beautiful. Wow. Giving your life to God. That's, that is so cool. But you would need to mourn. And in basically every culture in human history find one who doesn't do this you can't they have a process for if someone is going to change their social identity their community joins them on this slow and gradual process and it culminates in a ceremony where this change is made official and that ceremony is also a public space of eh, celebration but also a little bit of mourning. That's why parents cry at their kid's wedding. It's beautiful. Of course, they're happy to be there. But they are. there's a little bit of tears for the loss of the person, for the loss of the original identity that is now changing. So to, to take this all the way back to, to, the, to the trans issue, I, I think when uh, you know, kids are in your life, whether it's your kids or your kid's friends who are going this direction, I don't think you have to argue with them about whether surgery or whatever changes gender or whether it's good to be trans, I think it actually, if, if you're talking to a 14 year old, this is not relevant in their life for seven years. Um, I, I think you just say, look, we, you know, we can, we can talk about, we can continue to have a discussion about my worldview and what I think is good and healthy and, and all that. But what I do know is no social identity changes while you're, a minor and I wouldn't I wouldn't let you become a monk or a nun either like just no I wouldn't let you get married I no social I wouldn't let you become king you know I just, just no social identity <laughs> changes while you are a minor and so that is taking the heat 
of the debate out of it. It takes the heat out of it and allows for that period of just breathing and just having space. And that, cause that's where a lot of the tension can come in. If a kid, uh, uh, kids, I think gravitate to this idea for different reasons. And we are an hour and 15 minutes into this podcast. So I, <laughs> that I, I'll probably cover that in another episode of, um, I think my opinion about the different reasons. Um, and, and look, there are some people that they'll still be, they're going to be doing it when they're, you know, I mean, the the person I was hanging out with the other day is like 45 trans living that way, you know, for a long time. And um, so there are all sorts of different things going on with young people when they identify uh, this direction. But a lot of times there is a lot of pain behind it for whatever reason. Maybe it's unresolved trauma. Maybe it's some mental illness, or maybe it's just like, this is, this is what they're into or whatever. They, the point is there can be a million different reasons. And sometimes there's a lot of pain behind it. Behind it. And so talking to them when, when they're in the midst of that pain and debating whether or not this worldview is valid, I don't, I don't think that's very productive. I don't think it's going to get you very far, but saying, listen, there's from all of history, there's been a process for social identity change. And, uh, you need to, you need to follow that process. Cause I like, if your sibling wants to go get married at the same age as you, I won't let them do that. I won't let your other sibling at this age become a nun. Just listen, let, let's, let's take all of this off the table, the debate about who should be doing what, and just, say like that you can't make permanent changes until you're 21. And frankly, if you're going to like, there should be a ceremony or something. I mean, like that's a whole separate subject, yeah. but listen, the, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's the way to approach it is, is to frankly follow the, follow the religious order model. And when you're talking to minors, take the entire debate about whether it's right or wrong, whether it's good or bad, just take it off the table and say, so you just, you know, social identity changes, until you're 21 and that's not coming from me that's coming from all of human history that's coming from the 4.8 billion people who have been alive on this earth before you they had some time to figure all this out and all of them are saying chill out until you're 21 okay well that's it for this episode we i could go on i could go on but it's just too much hot fire it's too much hot fire for one episode join the patreon Join the Patreon and um, come out to my shows, jfcomedytour.com. We'll be talking about much less controversial <laughs> subjects there. New episode next week here on the Jen Fulweiler Show.